Hey, welcome to Lug Nuts. This is TJ. If the plot of pumps and dumps, batteries and switches, and frames dragging on asphalt makes your blood pump faster, then this next story is right up your alley. Check out our exclusive on the subculture of lowrider. There's no life like it. I was maybe 10 or 12 years old. I rode in a 73 Chevy Nova. When the guy I was with raised it up as high as it would go, I just thought that was the coolest thing out there. Some automotive historians place the emergence of low riding about the late 70s, but low riding's roots reach far deeper into history than that. Cruisers have been dropping Chevrolets to a sidewalk scraping stance since the late 1930s. When the lights go up at today's lowrider shows on hundreds of cars gleaming with chrome and elaborate metal flake paint jobs rolling on custom spoked rims, fans throughout America to Japan to Europe gasp with appreciation and envy. As low riding has taken the world by storm, it has also taken the mainstream automotive industry by surprise. No one seems to know where the world's number one auto trend came from. Some automotive enthusiasts even ride off the sport as a new cruiser on the block, eyeing hoppers in their high-performance hydraulics somewhat suspiciously. Wait a minute, hold up. I drive a 1963 Chevy Bel Air. It's a different model of an Impala. I've had the doors suicide. Frame has been wrapped for extra support. The hydraulic system's all in the trunk. The interior is completely redone. There's nothing, hardly anything left that's original on the car. I've spent about uh, five or six thousand dollars on just on uh, modifications alone. Right now, I didn't have any paint on it, so that that right there probably run about another thousand dollars. When it comes to money, I don't even like to think about it. Uh, tens of thousands, probably. Uh, if I had to add it all up between the times that you, you're always modifying something, and then you end up turning back around and modifying the same thing. The truck's never done. Money I've spent on the car has been astronomical, <laughs> if you think about it. Uh, the car itself was around eight grand, but it already had the frame wrap and the hydraulics on it. Um, since then, I've spent probably close to $7,000 doing the doors and the paint job and the interior. It's been a lot. Building lowriders, it is an art because it takes a lot of imagination uh, to start and to end with where you want to go with your ride. It, it amazes me just to see what can actually be done with metal and fiberglass and paint. Even the Smaller sports cars are coming out with, with airbag systems on them, so there's a lot out there. It's definitely an art. The main problem that I see in the uh, world of automotive customizing is that it's just too common just to buy a, a mass-produced fabricated piece and just bolt it onto your car. The people that are able to build these cars are very imaginative people. It takes a lot to see the car of where you're going from a, you know, just a normal car to a low rider and how to build it. You know, that takes a lot of talent. There's definitely a brotherhood when it comes to uh, encountering other people that are into low riding as well. You, may, you don't even have to know these people. You can just be getting gas or going to a grocery store or, or what have you. And you run into somebody who has a low rider, and it's like you know them, and you'll talk to them just like you've known them all your life. We can discuss car problems or, or ways to change things and make them better. You're able to talk to you know, other guys uh, about their, their car and talk about your car and where they're going with their vehicles, because obviously you'll never stop what you're doing. I think that the car clubs are the main key ingredient that, that keeps the lifestyle of low riders together. Car clubs are definitely a good thing to get into. Take mine, for instance. We're basically more friends than we are a car club. We get together every week and uh, discuss what's going on in our lives and what's going on with our vehicles. It's just part of a, a family. Car clubs. Um, I'm sure there's, wait, I don't, I don't know anything about car clubs. <laughs> car shows are a blast. I mean, that, that's really where you get to meet hundreds to thousands of people that share your like interest. 
and you have the opportunity to show them what you've done, you see what they've done, you get ideas from them, they get ideas from you, and that's really what, what keeps the sport going and, and really uh, moves the industry. I would call it a family event. The future of lowriding, I, I believe is, it'll change. Everything changes, but usually for the better. Uh, I would say it's still going to go strong. Uh, a lot of people are varying away from hydraulics. They're going more into airbags. It's just going to get better. There'll be something even better than air, some way that makes things simpler, but but better. I'm a little uncertain. Um, I'm, I'm a diehard old school hydraulic fan and I kind of had a little bit of resentment when the, air, when the airbags came around because I'm just, I'm, I'm about hydraulics, I'm about oil, I'm about batteries. It's tradition. The import tuner boys are eventually going to break off into their own little group because to me it's not the same as low riding. They can bolt on and weld anything on a car if they want, but it's going to look completely different than what a low rider actually is. Law enforcement on the low riders has definitely changed the last couple of years. Uh, they don't really focus on uh, low riding trucks and low riding cars that much. They're now focusing more on the speeding and the racing. In the past, uh, the cops came down on us pretty hard. Uh, I have plenty of tickets to back that up. I'm affectionately known by my club members as Ticket Boy. And the reason for this is that my low rider has accumulated me a total of 14 non-moving violations. So when it comes to law enforcement, I'm pretty much on a first name basis with them. I've, I've got tickets anywhere from uh, altered suspensions to uh, improper exhaust. I've gotten window tint tickets galore. And uh, it seems like here more so in, in, in the now, I think the police are focusing more so on the sport tuners, more of the street racers and more of the illegal things. And they're letting the less, lesser offenses like body modifications and maybe just being lowered. I think they're giving us a lot more slack. And that's, I think that's a good thing. I remember one time at a car show, I was dancing in my truck and there was probably about 50 or 60 people gathered around the truck while I was doing it. And the truck was all the way up. So I lifted up the tonneau cover, checked it out, and I noticed it was getting too hot, so I had to stop. And at that time, all the people were starting to gather around, you know, look what I had underneath the tonneau cover. And I did the pancake switch, which is, you know, dropping it all the way down. And when I did that, a pressure bolt broke and the whole crowd got sprayed with hydraulic oil, especially one guy that was standing directly behind it, he was soaked with hydraulic fluid. And the greatest part about that is nobody was really mad because they understand the, you know, that things like that happen. It was actually funny. I think the best thing that I can remember about the first time I lowered my truck probably was the day I was bringing it home, had a good buddy of mine with me, and we were just rolling down this uh, little back road. Kind of went into this dip and the way it dipped, the entire frame of the car hit the ground and it, and it sent sparks flying up both sides of the windows and that was uh, pretty much just a, a, a pinnacle moment of me that I had finally uh, reached that, that lower level that I wanted to reach. There's no stopping people from doing something wild to their car. There's a lot of wild things out there. Um, interiors on low riders are unbelievable to me. Um, when you can get in a seat and it turns towards a door and gets you in and out on its own, to me, that's pretty wild. The wildest thing I've ever seen somebody's done with hydraulics on a truck is uh, they have the scissor bed. Basically where that is, is they can lift the bed off the truck and just spin it round and round. They can make it go left and right, side to side, back and forth. They can basically dance the bed on the truck. Uh, one time at Nopi, I noticed they were doing that and the guy busted out his back window and it just drove the crowd crazy. And it was, that was pretty wild. I remember one year at Nopi, uh, it was uh, when the hydraulic competitions really started to get big and the, the, the manufacturers really started to come in and uh, sponsor the shops. There was this one car popping all four wheels off the ground, had to be getting three and a half, four feet off the ground, and, and this car flipped completely upside down and landed on its roof. That was the wildest, most aggressive show of, of the power the hydraulics have over a vehicle. Just to be able to take something that weighs tons and flip it over like it's nothing. Let's see, if I was to give advice to anybody just getting started in low riding, it would be choose your car wisely, because there's a lot to look at for a car, and um, learn a lot before you actually get started, because it's an expensive hobby. If you get into hydraulics, stuff breaks. Uh, keep $100 in your glove box, because everything that breaks is going to cost you $100. Go to car shows, talk to people, and find out who the best people are out there to customize your truck. And don't give up. It's a great thing to do.
Stick around, there's still much more to come.